When I was brought back to England in 1917, said Pew, I was given a hush-hush department. Our business was to decode and decipher German messages. The chap on my staff who interested me most was my second-in-command, Philip Channel. He was a man of 43 and had been a professor at some Midland college, mathematics or physics, I think. But I don't believe there was a man alive with more natural genius for cryptography. Well, we got on pretty well with our codes. We read the enemy messages, cables and wireless with a fair amount of ease and precision. But the more valuable stuff was in cipher. And that was another kettle of fish. A cipher, since it deals with numbers, is a horrible field for mathematical ingenuity. It would take too long to explain it simply, but to unlock it, you have to have the key word. It can't be done, I said. It was done frequently, said Pugh. By you? By my people. A channel, especially. You see, we didn't begin entirely in the dark. The way we worked was by trying a variety of clues till we lit on the right one. Well, I'm blessed, I said. But go on about your man Channel. Well, this isn't Channel's story, said Pew. He only comes into it accidentally. You see, there was one cipher which always defeated us. A cipher used between the German general staff and their forces in the east. We called it P.Y., and we hated it poisonously. We felt like pygmies battering at a high stone tower. Dislike of the thing soon became dislike of the man who conceived it. Channel and I used to torment ourselves by trying to picture the fellow who was responsible for P.Y. We knew no more than his code name, Reinmar, with which he signed the simpler messages. Channel, who was a romantic chap, had got it into his head that it was a woman, a she-devil, young, beautiful, with eyes like a cobra's. I fancy he read a rather low class of novel in his off time. My picture was different. I thought of the ruthless brain type with a high forehead. I couldn't sleep for hating him. Well, to make a long story short, there came a moment in September 1918 when P.Y. was about the most important thing in the world. It mattered enormously what Germany was doing in Syria, and we knew that it was all in P.Y. We had exactly a week to find the key to the cipher, and as we had failed to make anything of it in 18 months of quiet work, it didn't seem likely that we would succeed in seven feverish days. Channel nearly went off his head with overwork and anxiety. Well, we won, but only just. P.Y. made a mistake. One morning we got a long message, then a very short message, and then a third message almost the same as the first. The second one probably meant, your message of today's date is unintelligible, please repeat. This gave us a bit of the cipher, but even that would not have solved it. But it occurred to Channel that Reinmar might have signed the long message with his name. He was right, and within three hours we had the whole thing pat. Well, we finished the war, too tired to think of much, except that the darn thing was over. But Reinmar had been so long our unseen opponent that we kept up a certain interest in him. He must have known that we'd licked him. Now, usually when you beat a man, you rather like him, but I didn't like Reinmar. Now, for a year or two after the armistice, I was a pretty sick man. Our minds were fagged out, and there's no easy cure for that. Then a man told me about a German fellow called Christoph, who was said to be good at handling my kind of trouble. He had a small clinic at a place called Rosensee. Oh, well, by this time I was getting pretty desperate, so I packed a bag and went there. It was a quiet little town at the mouth of a valley. The clinic was halfway up a hill, and I felt better as soon as I saw my bedroom, with its bare, scrubbed floors and its wide veranda. I felt still better when I saw Dr. Christoph, he was a small man with a grizzled beard and a limp. His English was atrocious, but even when he found that I talked German fairly well, he didn't expand in speech. He would give no opinion of any kind until he had had me at least a week under observation. But somehow I felt comforted. To my delight, I found Channel was at the clinic too. He'd been having a thin time since we parted. Nerves were his trouble, and his college had given him six months' leave of absence to try to get well. He'd arrived a week before me, and, like me, was under observation. Dr. Christoph used to devote hours trying to unravel his nervous tangles. He's a good man, said Channel, but he's on the wrong track. There's nothing wrong with my mind. I wish he'd stop asking these silly questions. 
Channel and I used to go for walks in the woods, and we naturally talked about the years we'd worked together. Channel was still curious about our old antagonist, Reinmar. He was more positive than ever that she was a woman. I'd almost forgotten about the thing, and I was amused by Channel and his obsession. You won't find her in the clinic, I said. Perhaps she's in some old castle in the neighbourhood, waiting for you like the sleeping beauty. Oh, I'm serious, he said. After I leave here, I thought of going to Berlin to make some inquiries. But I know nobody, and I have no credentials. Why don't you take the thing up? I told him that my interest in the matter had flagged, and rather discouraged him from letting his mind dwell on events in the war. Well, that's not Dr. Christoph's opinion, he said. He encourages me to talk about it. You see, with me, it is purely intellectual interest. I have no emotion in the matter. I feel quite friendly towards Reinmar, whoever she may be. It is, if you like, a piece of romance. Have you told Dr. Christoph about Reinmar? I asked. Oh, yes. And he was mildly interested. You know the way he looks at you with his solemn grey eyes? I doubt if he quite understood what I meant. For a little provincial doctor, even though he is a genius in his own line, isn't likely to know much about the great general staff. I had to tell him, for I have to tell him all my dreams. And lately I have taken to dreaming about Reinmar. What's she like? I asked. Oh, a most remarkable figure. Very beautiful, but uncanny. Well, after a fortnight, I began to feel a different man. Dr. Christoph thought that he'd got on the track of my trouble, and I had more internal comfort than I'd known for years. He encouraged me to take long walks in the hills, and presently he arranged for me to go out shooting. I used to start before daybreak and drive to the top of one of the ridges where I would meet a collection of sportsmen and beaters. I remember we all ate our midday meal together, and one day, one of the guns, a lawyer called Meissen, asked me why I was visiting Rosensee. I said I was staying with Dr. Christoph. Oh, is he a friend of yours? he asked. I said no, that I'd come for treatment. We walked home together, and he talked about Dr. Christoph, and I learned how little honour a prophet may have in his own country. Meissen was mildly curious about him. The doctor is something of a hermit, he said and except for his patience, does not appear to welcome visitors. Yet he is a good man, beyond doubt, and there are those who say that in the war he was a hero. Well, oh, this surprised me, but Meissen was positive. Dr. Christoph had been in the trenches. The limping leg was a war wound. I'd had very little talk with the doctor, as my case was free from nervous complications. He'd say a word to me morning and evening about my diet and pass the time of day when we met, but it was not till the very eve of my departure that we had anything like a real conversation. He sent a message that he wanted to see me for not less than one hour, and he arrived with a batch of notes from which he delivered a kind of lecture on my case. Then I realised what an immense amount of care and solid thought he had expended on me. Finally, he took a sheet of notepaper from the table and wrote down for me a few simple instructions. There was something about him which I found curiously attractive. I detained him in talk, and he seemed not unwilling. By and by we drifted to the subject of the war, and it turned out that Meissen was right. Dr. Christoph had gone as a medical officer in 1914 to the Western Front, and had spent the winter there. In 1915 he had been in Champagne, and early in 1916 at Verdun, till he was invalided out with rheumatic fever. So he had had 17 months of consecutive fighting in the worst part of the line. A pretty good record for a frail middle-aged man. His family was then at Stuttgart, his wife and one little boy. He'd taken a long time to recover from the fever, and after that was put on home duty. Till the war was almost over, he said. There was just time for me to go back to the front and get my foolish leg hurt. I assumed that this home duty was medical, until he said something about getting rusty in his professional work. It appeared that it had been some job connected with intelligence. I have a little talent for mathematics, he said, so I was sent to work on ciphers. I had a sudden inspiration. I took a sheet of notepaper, scribbled the word Reinmar on it, and shoved it towards him. He stopped thunderstruck. How? How did you know? I hadn't known, and now that I did, the knowledge left me speechless. This was the loathly opposite for which Channel and I had nursed our hatred. 
When I came out of my stupefaction, I found that he had recovered his balance and was speaking slowly and distinctly. You were among my opponents. I often wondered. You beat me in the end. I nodded. You made a slip, I said. Yes, I made a slip. I let my private grief cloud my mind. I have often wished, it is childish to wish, to justify my failure to those who profited by it. In that month when I failed, I was in deep sorrow. I had a little son. His name was Weinmar, and I took his name for my coat signature. He was, as you say, my mascot. He was all my family, and I adored him. But in those days, food was not plentiful. The child was frail. In the last summer of the war, he died. With him, some virtue seemed to depart from my mind. You see, my work was, so to speak, his also, as my name was his. And when he left me, he took my power with him. So, I failed. We sat quite still, and then I remembered Channel. I asked him if Channel knew. A flicker of a smile crossed his face. He did know, and I will exact from you a promise never to breathe to him what I have told you. He is my patient. At present, he thinks that Reinmar is a wicked and beautiful lady whom he may someday meet. That is romance, and it is good for him to think so. If he were told the truth, he might pity me. And in her channel's condition, it is important that he should not be vexed with such emotions as pity.